All right, so there's three types of kettles. Uh, direct steam, electric, and gas. Uh, direct ski steam kettles, heat from a pressurized jacket of steam created by direct steam from an outside source. Um, that'll basically come from a steam generator. So basically it's a boiler and it'll send steam through a hose into the kettle jacket. Uh, tabletop style or with legs, um, one gallon up to 20 gallon. So generally 12, 40, it designates the gallon size. Direct steam is under pressure between five and 45 PSI with a high pressure option up to 100 PSI. Steam condenses inside the steam jacket and is removed by the steam trap. Um, uneven heating is usually a sign of a bad steam track. So that's one of the more common calls we get. Uh, it's not heating evenly. You would be checking for the steam trap. Most important component of the direct steam kettle is the pressure relief valve. That is obviously our safety. Uh, if we over if we over pressurize, this thing is basically like a ticking time bomb. So we want that to open up at generally 50 PSI. And you want to test the pressure relief valve every six months. Uh, you don't want to over test it. So generally the rule of thumb is if you're on a new site and you've never been there before, there's nothing in the history of us going there. You can test at that time. And then once you see it in the history, every six months, just go there. Uh, pull on it, make sure everything's good. Um, so this is just a basic setup. So we would have steam coming in through here. You usually have a red handle here. You would open it. As soon as you open that, let's steam through the jacket. And then it comes out through here and it would generally go down through your steam trap and then down into the drain. Um, this is a really older style. They don't really use these styles that much anymore because usually one boiler will run like two kettles and three steam compartments. But if that boiler goes down, now you have five pieces of equipment down. So this style is not as popular as it used to be. All right, pressure relief valve, the single most important component of the boiler base, opens at 50 PSI, test every six months. With 100 PSI on high pressure options, we don't see that high pressure option. Steam trap lets the cool air and condensate out and keeps the hot steam in. The trunnion is the mechanism of tilting models that allows for tilting, includes O-rings for sealing the system. And then finally, the draw valve mechanism on stationary models that allows product to flow out. So all that is, is just say you have soup in the kettle. You open this out, they dump it out into a bucket or a pot or whatever they're using. All right, kettle won't boil. Verify supply pressure. So obviously, make sure the boiler, the pressure boiler is working. Uh, check the inlet valve. So that red handle I was talking about earlier, sometimes that isn't opening up. All that is is like a gate valve, like you would see on a regular residential water hose. Um, and then lastly, replace the steam trap. And uh, all that's saying is it's supposed to trap the steam so that it stays in the kettle. So if that's wide open, um, it's, it's literally just flowing right through. Uh, and then kettle heats unevenly. The first thing you're going to go to in the majority of the time, it's going to be the issue is going to be the steam trap. All right, so this is just a tilting model. This is the trunnion right here. Um, all it does is it tilts on this trunnion. Okay, this is a model that has the gearbox. So that means um, you turn this handle here and it starts tilting it for you. Okay, they're just showing here how to replace a trunnion O-ring. They want you to use a port of power. Okay, so here's the assembly of that red handle I was talking about. Okay, so these are common for leaking. So it'll leak from these O-rings. 
Um, there is an O-rings um, lubricant. You have to use the specific one. If not, the O-rings will dry out. You have to get the one from Cleveland. And generally, why these will leak is uh, if the unit is oversteaming or if there's water. So if there's water, that means either the pressure boiler is scaled up or the water level probe isn't working and we're go we're, the water's filling too high. Uh, water will damage these O-rings. And the complaint you'll get is um, when we turn it on, hot steam's coming out of here or water's dripping out of here all day. Uh, these are pretty simple to, to, to replace. All right, so we'll move on to electric kettles. So this is a self-contained unit. We no longer have a pressure boiler. Okay, so they heat from a pressurized jacket of steam created from an electric heating element source. They can be tilt or stationary, tabletop or with legs. They go three gallon to 100 gallon. And once again, the designation 12, 20, 40 would be how many gallons? Okay, electric kettles are under pressure between 22 to 28 PSI at a temperature of 265 Fahrenheit. So temperature is relative to pressure. So as our pressure goes up, our PSI goes up. So if you look on your gauge and you see you're above 28 PSI, um, there's some troubleshooting hints right there. Okay, we're probably overheating. Okay, we should never go over 265. Once we start going over 265, our pressure starts going up. And once we get to 50 PSI, we release the, we release the prefer, pressure relief valve. So if a customer is calling in and saying, hey, this pressure relief valve keeps going off, um, it probably is getting weak if it's done it a bunch of times. But you have to investigate the real reason why it's going off. And it's generally because you're going above 265. Uneven heating is usually a sign of trapped air or overfilling. So inside this jacket, it's very important to vent it, which we're going to get into that procedure a little bit later. And if you overfill it as well, um, that'll give issues as well with uneven heating. The elements are 208, 240. All right, so you can only use distilled water, uh, just regular water. Once we, as we know, as we go above 100 Fahrenheit, it'll start boiling off. Okay, and you have to use rust inhibitor. So I've only had to use rust inhibitor on one call. And what was happening for me was I kept filling the kettle. So I, I had a big guy. I think it was, it was probably it was probably a 60 or an 80 gallon. Okay, and we kept getting low water. So I filled up the kettle with distilled water and then call me back two days later. I couldn't figure out the problem. What was happening was uh, the rust inhibitor is what makes it sense um, if there's water in there. So uh, Noble Trade does sell this rust inhibitor. I found that it took me a while to trace this down. If you go to Napa, they do not sell this. I did go to Napa and they've never heard of this. So that's like a US part number. So just keep in mind if you're flushing a whole kettle or if you're just changing water in it and you keep getting the, the low water light, it means you have to put in that rust inhibitor. And then once again, test the per pressure relief valve every six months. Okay, we'll go to the table mount version. With the trunnion, meaning we can tilt it. So everything is underneath the unit, um, which makes things difficult because if everything's underneath here, okay, yeah, you can tilt it and then troubleshoot. But once you tilt it, there's a switch that tells it, hey, once we're tilted, we're going to go into low water. Well, it's going to go into low water regardless. So troubleshooting this one becomes a little bit complicated. You kind you have to get underneath it, okay? So here we're just showing where the water probes are, um, the elements. We got one high limit, and then we have our thermistor for our temperature sensing. Okay, these elements are welded into the kettle. Okay, so if the element goes bad, uh, it can only be fixed back at the factory, and at that point, it's probably not even worth repairing. Um, this is just the design they went for. Obviously, they're worried about water leakage so they've welded them in all right so this is where you do your troubleshooting inside this cover it's a little bit difficult um i will try to take this nut off and slide this whole panel up and out 
as far as I can so I can get my hands in there and get my meter in there. You can't slide it all the way out. And keep in mind when you're troubleshooting, it's live. So I'll prop something underneath like a piece of wood just to bring it up enough for me to get my leads in there. It's really tight. As you can see, you can test incoming power and that's about it. Okay, and then these are just our lights, our potentiometer, which is how we set our temperature from one to, to 10. 10 would in. equal 265 Fahrenheit. All right, so it's just showing the controller here. So you can see here, they've removed it completely. So depending on your incoming power, if they've left the wire long enough, you can actually pull it out this far. If the incoming power wire is short, you can't pull it out this far. Okay. Um, so a gray to black is 16 volts AC. Okay, our potentiometer, the range is 0 to 50K. And our thermistor is uh, 0 to 100K, or sorry, it's 100K at room temperature. So this has a potentiometer and a thermistor. So it gets a little bit complicated when you're troubleshooting it. And the resistances are different on them. So they have to be troubleshooted separately. Calibration temperatures, 265. And it shows all the other components, the transformer, the contactor, the DC relay. Okay, so the controller, uh, it energizes the heat circuit. It uses thermistor input as well as potentiometer saying to determine when to energize the elements. So basically you get a signal from the thermistor and the potentiometer, and it tells it how long to keep the element on for. So number 10 would be 265 Fahrenheit. Potentiometer uh, varies resistance between zero to 50K. So as you can see, zero is high, 50K is low. So it actually goes, as it, as it gets hotter, the uh, resistance actually drops, okay? So then we have our thermistor. It monitors temperature. When the thermistor resistance is higher than the potentiometer resistance, unit calls for heat. We get a 16 volts DC from the controller, sends it to the coil relay, and then the green light will be energized approximately 100 ohms at room temperature. Our water probe, water level safety, le sorry, water level heat safety. If not grounded by water for more than sec five seconds, unit will not heat and control energize, energize the red LED. So basically we need to sense water for five seconds. If we don't, the red LED comes on, which is the low water light. And obviously there'll be no heating because we don't want to heat with no water or even low water because um, the pressures will just be that much higher. Okay, the DC relay, uh, the coils energized by the controller and then energizes the coils of the contactor. The heat contactor, coils energized by the DC relay, contacts energize the heating element. So they're, they're in series with the heating elements. The safety contactor, coils energized by DC relay, secondary source to de-energize the heating circuit if the contacts of the heater contact fail closed. So all that is, it's a, a safety contactor, which we've talked about in the other trainings. Okay, if one fails closed, well, we want a backup, especially on a boiler like this. Um, we do not want that pressure relief valve not to be working, and then our pressure gets above 100 PSI because now we're just in a situation where it's literally a bomb. Uh, so the heating elements are welded into the jacket. They're submerged in water, and when energized, steam's produced. All right, so here is our schematic. So we can see our elements. Okay, and then we show our contacts here, and then our terminal block. Now we're going to get into a bit more detail on that shortly. So we're going to focus on the 208 circuit. So standard ke kettle control circuit, some control circuits for electric and gas kettles. The difference occurs in the Heat circuit controlled by the RY2 DC relay. So the only difference between the, the gas and electric is this relay here. The schematics almost identical. Okay, and as we can see, we come through the safety thermostat. This These contacts have to close so that the coil gets power. 
Okay, solid state control test instructions. So this board does flash. They tell you not to pay attention to it because it it's kind of funny how it tests. So rapid flashing during normal operation. So they actually tell you not to really pay attention to these lights. Well, let's just go through it quickly. Um, turn the unit on and set it to number 10. Push and hold the switch button for approximately five seconds until the CPU flashes for one second. You're now in test mode. Output to 12 volt relay is disabled. So all it's saying is we're not going to go into heat mode. Okay. With the kettle upright, diagnostic LED should be green. With the kettle tilted, it should be red. So that's that option I was talking about. If we're tilted, we're not going to heat. Uh, push switch button. The CPR starts to flash for two seconds. You're now in test number two. Check the diagnostic LED for indication of temperature probe status. And finally, you're going to push it and you get the third flash. Um, this is the heater output LED. Should light for 20 seconds and power the relay. Should energize a 12 volt relay for the heat source. After 20 seconds, test mode is over and unit reverts to normal operation. So they generally tell us not to run this test. Uh, there's other ways you, you can just test this just by taking resistances and checking voltages. All right, so here's our schematic again, which we're going to go over shortly. So first one, diagnostics. So we're not heating. When the switch on the potentiometer closes, the 16 volts AC is sent to the controller. Verify 16 volts AC between the black and gray. So power in through this transformer is right here. Okay, so that's the first step. The potentiometer is the input for the heat circuit. On the lowest setting, the resistance is 50,000 ohms. When set at the high, it's near a short. It is near a... Oh, that's not right. When set at high, it should be zero ohms. Verify resistance between the blue and the orange. So like I said, these guys work together. Okay, the potentiometer. So you're going to do that test. Set it at either zero or 10. So I'll do both. I'll go 50 ohms and then I'll go set it to 10. And it should be about zero ohms at 10. If you're not getting that, this component's bad. Okay, next we're going to go through the thermistor. So once we verified this circuit's good, we're going to come through the thermistor. So that's measuring the actual heat in the kettle. So this is basically your thermostat. So at room temperature, the resistance is 100,000 ohms. So when you're arriving on, well, you're not going to have a call for heat anyways. So you'll probably be at room temperature. You want to check it 100,000 ohms. Okay, and then... With bottom cover removed. So they want you to check the thermistor here. So all that's saying is if you're not getting it, if you're not getting it um, at the board here between two and seven, go and confirm that it's here just so we know it's not a bad wire inside this trunnion. When the controller compares the resistance of the thermistor to the set thermist resistance on the potentiometer, if they're not within 3000 ohms of each other, the RY relay is energized. All right, so it's comparing this one here, which was zero to 50,000. And then it's comparing this one, which is 100,000 at room temperature. So if they're not within 3,000 ohms of each other, okay, we're going to energize the RY relay. Okay, so at this point, we came in with 12 volts AC. We're going to send 12 volts DC because it's a DC relay. Um, and as we've been talking in the training, that means there's polarity. So if you mix up the two wires on the coil, guess what? It's not going to work. So if you ever change the relay and you're like, oh, I have the voltage here, but it's not working. It's probably they're backwards if it's a brand new part. All right, so now we get, our coil's hot. Okay, once the coil gets hot, this green light comes on. Um, this green light is also DC voltage, which means, uh, polarity has to be checked when you're wiring a new one. But here's a hint here. If the green LED is not getting power or if it's not lighting up, most likely this coil is not getting power. So that means you, 
you start working backwards and you would go back to the probably the thermistor and this potentiometer. So that's a hint on this kettle, especially it's so tight to test, you, you don't need to go point to point, okay? You'd obviously check power in, but if this green light's not coming on, I'm gonna start with this circuit here, okay? Okay, when the R2 relay is energized, it's gonna close the contacts. So we're gonna close this guy here, right? So if our high limit's good, we're gonna close this, and then our contactor coil is gonna get hot. Okay, if the ROI2 relay is energized, and we're not getting power into here, into this relay, obviously work backwards, go upstream, check the safety thermostat. So whenever this green light's on and you're not heating, the first thing you want to test is this safety thermostat. So these are hints too that you can use so you don't have to troubleshoot every component. Okay, and that's the point of this is using the schematic and using these LEDs and all the hints the machine's giving you not to test all the components. So green LED on, I'm going to go check, test this guy first. Okay, it's the first thing in line and it's the most common failure if you get that issue. And then we showed the high limit earlier, but it's down in the bottom here. All right, so we're just gonna go over this really quickly. So we get our 16 volts AC in, okay? Then we have to get our zero to 50K in this section, okay? Then we have to get our 100K here, and it has to be 3000 ohm difference from this guy. Once that happens, our board's gonna convert 16 volts AC to 12 volts DC. This guy's gonna get hot. The green LED is gonna turn on. And then at that point, if this guy's on, the next thing you would check if there's no heat is go right to this high limit. Okay, now we're gonna go through a low water situation. If the red low water light comes on and stays on, place a jumper from white to green. If the red LED light stays energized, there's a bad controller, okay? So all this is doing here is coming, is jumping from five to seven, okay? So it's sensing if there's water inside the kettle. So the kettle jacket has resistance and so does water, okay? So the probes touching the kettle jacket, or sorry, if the water touches the kettle jacket and the probe, it should ground it out. Okay, water is a conductor, not an insulator. So if you think you have a bad probe, you can jumper this out. Okay, you can also jumper out um, the uh, potentiometer, blue to orange. Okay, so why we would jumper out blue to orange? Just say the potentiometer is bad. Generally, when the potentiometer is bad, there might be another issue. So you don't want to do a repeat visit. So you can actually jump around blue to orange and see if the unifier is up. Okay. And then obviously if you jumper this five to seven and the red light doesn't come off, well, you need, you need a board or controller. Okay. So here we're showing our probe down here. And then we're showing if a jumper does cause the red LED to go out, take the white wires to the chassis. Okay, so what you can actually do is ground the white wire. So you take it off of here, just ground it to the chassis. If you ground it to the chassis and then the red light comes off, that means your probe is not sensing water. So like I was talking about that service call I had with the rust inhibitor, as soon as I would ground that white wire out, my kettle would fire up but it was a brand new probe and it was brand new water. What was happening was the water was too pure. I had to put that rust inhibitor and it was intermittent. So it worked for two, three days. So that's one other way that you can test to see if the probe's bad. Just ground out, take the, take the wire, white wire off that nut and ground it to the chassis. All right, so now we're gonna get into the 40T, which is the leg mount with the trunnion. So this one has a lot more going on. Uh, all the contactors are underneath, which makes troubleshooting very difficult when you're trying to, because you have to literally lay underneath the kettle. All right, so we have our high limit, the potentiometer, our LED, 
our thermistor, the heat contactor, the transformer, that same 12 volt DC relay, the elements which are welded in, our control box which they use on all their models, the black box, the water probe which is that same one we're just talking about the white wire grounding it out. Okay, here's the schematic. We're going to go into that pretty oh, actually we're not it doesn't go into this one but it's the exact same schematic. DC relay with the box and the contactors. Okay. Okay, so venting the kettle. Um, so venting the kettle is pretty important. We said earlier about if there's air in there or low water, you're going to have, uh, it's not going to heat great. Okay. So let's go through this quickly. So re remove guard bracket from the pressure relief valve gauge assembly. So you want to turn the kettle on, set it to number 10. You want it empty. Vent the kettle by pulling the, the valve ring eight to 10 times in short two to three second blast with a five second interval between. Okay. So what Frank actually taught us is if you, if you get it hot, um, just pull on it and it's going to be, it's going to make a loud hissing noise. And then the, the, uh, it's going to change to a lower hum. And I've actually done this and it does work and it saves a lot of time. Okay, and then that part at that point, you would throw ice in the kettle. And then when you come to your gauge, it should be below zero. Okay, there's this vent part's usually green. And you want to be down there. If that if it's still not green, okay, then you're gonna have to go back and heat it up again and pull that thing for uh that means you didn't pull it for long enough. And you can see it here. We're in the green. That's good. So calibration instructions, ensure the kettle is at room temperature and has a vacuum before you begin the calibration process. Uh, vacuum meaning what we just talked about. It's got to be vented. It's got to be in that green section. So you want to turn the kettle on. You want to set it to 10. Cycle it twice. Uh, using a digital uh, surface thermometer. So that's the surface probe. You don't want to use a laser or any other type of um, probe. This is the most accurate one. Okay, and locate the hottest point on the kettle surface. So if you go dead center in the bottom of the kettle, so you're inside the kettle now, okay, where the uh, where the product would go. I find it's anywhere from six to 10 inches up. So start sliding it upwards towards the top of the kettle. You'll find the hottest spot. So if you go in the middle, just say it's 255. There might be another spot that's 265. Why that's important is because if we calibrate to 255, but other spots are 265, we're going to overpressurize. So it's, this uh, calibration is super important for you not to overpressurize. So note the temperature on the unit cycles off. It should be between 260 and 265. If adjustment is required, turn the potentiometer slightly clockwise to increase or counterclockwise to decrease. So on that black box that we're talking about, um, if you have a, you need a, a thin screwdriver, uh, you can do adjustments there and it's not uncommon that you have to adjust that. Uh, I find that happens a lot that they just come out of adjustment. And then if I have to go back a second time and it's come out of adjustment again, I'm just changing that black box. So I'll allow you to cycle twice, locate the hottest point and recheck temperature of the inner kennel surface with a digital surface thermometer, repeat steps five through eight until the unit is calibrated. Okay, and they're at, uh, Frank was talking about this tool here so you don't short anything out. Um, yeah, it's nothing I've ever used. But it's like, a, I think it's like a graphite uh, shaft or something so you can't short it out. It does get tight in there, but it, it is doable. Okay, so if you have a bad wire harness in the trunnion, you have to replace the entire wire harness. So what happens, because that, kettles tilting all the time if one wire broke that means the rest of them are all worn down they've all been they've all been uh, bent in that position okay okay this is just going back over things so if a leak is suspected 
okay? So you go there, uh, you fill it up, and it keeps leaking. First trip, remove all components screwed into the jacket and reseal. So that would be your water probes, your, uh, your, I think it's just a water probe. The elements are welded, so it won't be that. The thermistor shouldn't be threaded in. So anything that's threaded in underneath the kettle, and then anything in that pressure relief valve system, uh, we want to put the uh, that food grade safe dope on it. Okay, and then if you have to go for a second trip, they're recommending replacing all the components that are screwed into the jacket. Okay, so Frank was saying, add red nail polish right here. So as soon as this pulls, this part here is going to pull off, okay? So what happens a lot of times, the customer pulls that pressure relief valve, and I've seen this happen so many times. And every time they pull that, obviously steam's coming out of the, the uh, jacket, which means that's water, right? So if, they, if you put a piece of nail polish from here to here, it'll break that seal because when they push it back together, it won't go back in the same spot. So that's a really common thing when you're seeing that you keep going back for low water. So it's important to mark that if you, if you go back two, three times. All right, let's get into the gas kettles now. So heat from a pressurized jacket of steam created from a gas burner. So a burner underneath, it's heating it. So instead of the element, that's what we're using. Okay, they can be tilt or stationary. Same stuff as before, table stop. Tape, table top, top style or legs, and we go three gallon to 900 gallon. Gas kettles are under pressure at 25 PSI, plus or minus three PSI at high temperature. Um, and 265, that's the magic number for all the kettles, okay? Gas kettles can operate on GFCI receptacles, uh, 25 gallon lower are atmospheric burners and use a spark ignition. 40 gallon higher are power burners and use hot surface igniters. Okay, so this one here is just a general burner. It sparks, it goes. This one actually has the power burner with the pressure switch. It has to prove all that before you even get ignition. Both ignition models require a minimum of one microamp to prove flame. All right, this is a 25 gallon. So we're gonna go through the circuit. It's the same circuit. So we'll skip through this part till we get to the troubleshooting. And so the only difference now is when our RY1 coil gets hot, we're gonna close these contacts. We're gonna come through this transformer. So everything up here is the exact same as the electric, okay? Same thing, safety thermostats in line, everything, okay? So just say you come to this call and the first thing I would kind of check is I would go to this transformer, okay? Do I have 120 in? If I don't, I'm troubleshooting this way. If I have 120 in and 25 out, I put the blinders on. I'm just troubleshooting down here, okay? And if we have 120 here, we know we can, we don't have to troubleshoot anything in this tight box here, okay? Okay, so here's the sequence. So the heat circuit, when the normally open contacts close, okay? So this contact here that we're just talking about, the R1 relay, it closes. We get 120 in, 24, 24 out. Then we get 24 to the gas valve, okay? As soon as 24 valves volts come on the gas valve, we're going to get spark immediately. And then we need to sense one microlamp. Okay, this is the 40 gallon, so this one's gonna have the power burner. Uh, so same thing, low water light. Uh, this one has an ignition lockout. Uh, the heat light potentiometer, still the same reading. And this has a water level gauge, okay? So this water level gauge is the number one place that the gas kettles leak from. There's an O-ring in here that generally leaks or the glass will leak. Okay, so if you have a, if you have a leak on a uh, gas unit, um, go check that first. Okay, and we're using 3.5 inches water column. All right, so here's our top view. We show our gas valve inside the box, which <laughs> isn't really helpful. 
uh, potentiometer. There's our burner. Here's our electric box. And then our blowers here, the power burner. So that's the only difference between the 40 gallon and up. We have the power burner, which obviously makes complicates the circuit a little bit. Uh, we come in, we have our water probe, which is the same probe I was telling you you could ground out if you want to test it. Okay, just take the wire off, ground it off. Um, if the red light comes off, well, you know that whole circuit's good, the board, the wire, everything. Um, the problem is we're not sensing the water. Uh, we have our thermistor, we have our igniter. So on this one, we're saying we now go to, we don't have the spark igniter, we now go to a glow igniter. Uh, we have our sight glass for the burner. And then burner and high limit. All right, so here's the electric box, which is underneath the unit. And usually you can take this front panel off right here and you troubleshoot through here. So as you can see, it's super tight. And usually I'll remove components, pull them out and test them because it, it gets pretty difficult to test them. All right, so we have our module, the ignition transformer, which sends the 120, bumps it down to 24 for the module, same DC relay. Okay, we have a control transformer. Here's our air switch, which is proving that the power burner is running and the high limit. So here's our schematic. Actually, this is a wiring diagram, which we prefer the schematics. But as you can see, everything's identical, except now we've added this section here. Okay, and then on this one, we have an air switch right here. All right, so we'll go through it again. So 16 volts come in and then next from blue to orange, we need zero to 50 K and then we need a hundred K on the thermistor. Uh, it has to be 3000 ohms greater than the potentiometer. And then once that happens, we convert our 16 volts. Uh, AC to 12 volts DC which isn't marked on this one, uh, between the yellow and the brown. So right here, you can see our relay. Yeah, this one's wiring. This is why we don't really like wiring diagrams. It's kind of, uh, it's kind of a basic way to troubleshoot. The schematics are always better. But same exact circuit. So that's one thing Cleveland's done good is they use the same circuits. All right. So now let's go into the gas side of it. Okay, so once we get 120 volts, uh, we send it to the transformer. Now we have to go through an air proving switch. Okay, once the air proving switch shows that we're running, which means the power burner is running, then we send the 24 volts to the module. And at that point, the ignition module sends 120 volts to the igniter. Okay, 20 to 40 seconds later, 24 volts is sent to the gas valve. Okay, so we have a nice little um, delay here. So when you're testing it, don't expect your gas valve to get hot for 20 to 40 seconds. One microamp is sensed when flame is present. Okay, so what happens on this one? Uh, if you reverse the polarity on a flame sensor because it comes through the neutral, uh, you'll never sense flame. Okay, so it's super important that we don't reverse them. Uh, it says right here, ignition module is polarity sensitive. So it's talking about the flame sensor. Uh, gas pressure is 3.5 inches water column, which we spoke about earlier. Okay, if, they, if the blower fan, ha for any reason, slows down in uh, CFM, so if it collects dust, and that's usually the most common reason, so it'll collect dust on that intake, you will get high levels of CO. Okay, Uh so I've had the call where they're like, oh, the kettle's burning us. And I would go on saying, like, what are you talking about? There's no flames coming out the flue or anything. How is it burning you? What they were saying was there was so much CO that it was like burning your eyes. So as soon as I put my face over, obviously I made sure there's no shooting flames. I wasn't right over. I could feel it. I could, like, you could, it was really bad. Like, even when you, when you breathed it in, you could feel it. Um, and the reason for that was, the, uh, there wasn't enough CFM through that uh, blower motor power or the uh, not the blower motor the power burner okay all right so here's uh, I guess we're going over all the stuff here so 265 
Okay, if we have a wire break in the trunnion, replace the whole harness. Okay, if you measure 115 volts across the high limit. Okay, so you're measuring across on the same line. So on the red line, well, we're measuring across potential difference. If we have, if we don't have zero volts, that means we are open. And then 3.5 inches water column is what we're looking for.